This is the Tom Bigby Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. I write about a small town in northeast Mississippi on the Tongue Bigby River called Columbus. Sometimes I write about the rest of the state. This episode is about an area near Columbus and Columbus at large. John Gordon, George Washington Marshall, also known as George Washington Evans, Alex Latham, and Essex Green in 1875. In November of 1871, Klan intimidation had reached a boiling point in the South, and congressional investigators came to Columbus, led by General Blair, to examine the condition of affairs in southern states. The Ku Klux Klan Act, H.R. 320, had been enacted in April of 1871, outlawing intimidation and giving President Grant the ability to declare martial law. Columbus resident and former state senator, the African-American former slave, Robert Gleed, gave testimony before congressional investigators that included a lengthy discussion on whippings for those who voted Republican. He also discussed the whippings of black teachers and the murder of black men on both the Halbert and Durden plantations. According to Gleed, the Klan sought to disenfranchise black Republicans, which outnumbered white voters in Lowndes County. Then, in November 1874, Lowndes County Democrats were concerned about the upcoming election and formed the White Liners to further intimidate Black voters. The weekly Mississippi Pilot reported on June 26, 1875, the circulation of handbills, which threatened the jobs and access to medical treatment of anyone who voted Republican. The White Liners did not limit their activities to Lowndes County, and the Mississippi plan of Democratic redemption was in full swing across the state. In Vicksburg, Democrats demanded the resignation of the town's black sheriff, Peter Crosby, and went on to kill him and over 300 blacks in the surrounding county. In September 1875, the White Liners killed at least 50 blacks in Hines County and murdered a white teacher who taught in black schools. In late October of 1875, the Klan descended on the Dover community in Yazoo County, and two white teachers were killed because they dared to vote Republican. It was in this environment of fear and intimidation that the perfect storm was brewing for the Lowndes County Sheriff's election of 1875. Local papers ran circulars on the candidates titled, Stand to Your Colors, that listed those who were, quote, worthy, meaning white local Southern men, and unworthy carpetbaggers from the North and African-American men. Uh, Local Democrats held meetings all over the county daily for two weeks prior to Election Day. Each meeting was attended by 25 to 50 young men from Columbus who would drag around a 12-pound cannon that they would fire. The Columbus Brass Band would be in attendance. Speeches were held most nights on the courthouse steps, inciting voters to take action and protect their interests. The local paper ran many articles, editorials, and campaign reviews that described Black candidates and Republican leaders as, quote, Black roots and, quote, worse than carpetbaggers and plotting to, quote, endanger the virtue of every white woman in the county. The editor... And, uh, who was one of the founders of the Klan in Lowndes County, used the paper to fan the flames and influence the upcoming election with hyperbole and unfair racial caricatures, a common practice at the time. The night before the election, the Republicans planned to hold a torchlight parade, and Robert Gleed knew that such a political spectacle might attract violence. One columnist in the November 13th, 1875 issue of the weekly Mississippi Pilot reported that Gleed advised his supporters to arm themselves, quote, only for the purpose of defense in a case of attack. By 8 p.m., as Gleed's supporters gathered at Union Academy on the south side of town, a large group of whites gathered at Hatch's Drugstore in downtown, which sat along the parade route. When a band of drummers and paradors marched past, whites rushed Gleed's supporters and smashed the heads of their drums. 
All was reportedly quiet for the next hour. Then a fire was reported on the southeast side of the depot. The fire department hitched up the steam engine and raced toward the fire. Five minutes later, another fire was reported. It was George Curtis's old shed on 4th Avenue South. A third fire was reported at the old Taylor stable west of the courthouse behind modern day Zachary's restaurant. A cry falsely went out that the blacks were torching the city. The white crowd raced home for their weapons and the black and the Columbus riflemen set up pickets at each corner. Squads of armed white men moved down the streets. Mounted men scoured white neighborhoods for black men. The Alabamians mysteriously arrived to, quote, help. Blacks fled town and hid. Any African American found on the street was ordered to halt. If they did not, they were either wounded or killed. Squads were then sent to the homes of leading black members of the GOP and told if there were any more fires, they and their families would be held responsible. Scores of white men and boys followed the squads as they descended on Robert Gleed's house. He and his wife were not there. The mob broke into his house and destroyed his furniture and belongings. They slashed the breast of all his wife's clothing and those of his daughter. Some in the crowd prepared to light fire to his house, but were stopped by squad leaders. Gleed was nowhere to be found. His friend, the white attorney, Cornelius Lincoln, had hid him in his well under his house on 3rd Avenue South, just blocks away from the chaos and mayhem. His wife and children, Gleed's wife and children, had already been hidden out of town. That night, four men were killed. John Gordon was killed in front of Gleed's and Rab's stores on Market Street. During the night, four men were killed, and several men and one woman were injured. John Gordon was killed, quote, on the sidewalk in front of Gleed's store. According to the weekly Mississippi Pilot, accidentally, one account says accidentally another that he was aiming a pistol at a passing guard. Another uh, article in the Pickens County Herald sa- states the villainous teachings of Gleed had developed into a culmination, and the culmination ended in swift retribution. John Gordon, a drunken, dangerous Negro, was the first victim. He fell in front of Jack Rabb's store. George Marshall, age 9 or 10, was killed in front of Cornelia Benoit's home on Main and 6th. Benoit was a widowed mother of a teen daughter. George Marshall, according to this article, Affairs at Columbus, was killed near Mrs. Benoit's residence. It is said he had a gun in his hand and refused to surrender it when commanded. No explanation is provided on where and how a child would have had a gun in his possession, but the Clarion Ledger puts the blame on Sheriff's candidate Robert Gleed. George Washington, when shot, was aiming at one of the guards and confessed in dying that Gleed gave him the gun. Alex Latham, a disabled shoemaker who is reported to have a prosthetic leg, was dragged from his home at 4 a.m. and shot in the street in front of his wife Judy and son Alex Jr., According to the same article, Affairs at Columbus and the Weekly Mississippi Pilot, Alex Latham, a crippled shoemaker, it is said, was with a company of two or three who, in the early part of the trouble, had fired at a squad of guards as they passed. At about four o'clock in the morning, he was taken from his house and shot. Sharecropper Essex Green and his wife headed into their cotton field at daybreak, unaware of any of the the affairs of what had happened in town the night before. Riders from town were passing through and allegedly ordered them to halt, but they panicked and ran, not knowing why they were being told to stop. Uh, Again, in the same article, Affairs at Columbus, Essex Green and his wife were reported to have been going to their cotton patch at daybreak in the eastern suburbs of town and being commanded to halt, started to run, when they were fired upon and Green was killed by a shot through the head and his wife wounded. Election day was quiet in town. There was understandably a low black voter turnout. Those who did venture to the polls were warned by white liners to vote a straight Democratic ticket. 
The final vote was tallied, and Democratic candidate Hargrove won by landslide. According to the Pickens County Herald, we hope the colored people have at last found that incendiary teaching must and will always end in their being the sufferers. The next day, Robert Gleed was on his way to Paris, Texas with his wife and children, running to escape certain lynching in his adopted hometown of Columbus, Mississippi. Abandoning his properties and businesses, he fled with the clothes on his back to start over. Gleed left behind his general store almost 300 acres of farmland, three city lots, all his businesses, and his home. I want to thank you for coming on my podcast, The Tom Bigby Tales. Until next time.